Now, ECAM, the procedure, the checklist, the SOP was asking us to balance the fuel. And to do that, we'd open cross feeds and transfer the fuel from the heavy side, which is the unaffected wing, over to the left-hand side, the wing that's full of holes and electrical wires, short-circuiting. And you, you thought, hang on a minute, it wants us to do what? Didn't really pass the common sense test. So the system, the SOP, was asking us to do something that didn't make sense. So this is where sometimes the procedure doesn't work. And I'll talk about that in a moment. You remember the aeroplane that ditched in the Hudson River? Uh, it was about a year before our accident. Captain Chesley Sullenberger and Jeff Stiles, the first officer. What do you reckon the first thing? When these, that aeroplane hit those birds straight after takeoff, what was the first thing that they did? Apart from swearing. Grab the checklist. Hang a hat on the... They had about a minute and a half. Very quickly it became obvious the checklist is not going to help. They had to improvise very quickly. And it, it does a number of things. It uh, communicates the situation to the passengers and the cabin crew, who they're in the same loop, if you like, as the, as the, as the passengers. I think more importantly, it gives them, gives you some, some confidence that there's somebody in charge, that somebody's doing something about this. And uh, I mentioned that the aircraft is now safe and uh, that you're safe, or at least for the moment you are. And, uh, and we're busy, and we'll get back to you. And, and we, did, we did a number of PAs. Now, I was always um, inspired by uh, the British Airways incident back in the early 80s. There was a uh, British Airways flight over in Indonesia that went through a volcanic ash cloud, and Captain Eric Moody had a very calm and uh, uh, controlled PA. So uh, this is what I thought about when I... <laughs> I have a thing called a shallow cockpit gradient. What that means is the captain is in charge, but he's got to be open to suggestions from his crew. But he does make the final decision. And technology, it, wasn't, it was there, but it wasn't really helping terribly much that day. So we have to use, find solutions with the help of technology, not depend on that technology for the solutions, and don't follow it blindly. So ladies and gentlemen, that's what we did. We got 469 people down in one piece. And we use a lot of teamwork, not just the pilots, it was the cabin crew, the air traffic control, the fire services, even the passengers help. We've got just one time for one question. Obviously people listening in the audience will be wondering about parallels for their own situations. Um, and one thing that I think was intriguing about your point about a shallow hierarchy, yeah. a clear person in charge. Yes. Um, and I just wondered if you could talk briefly about the change in culture that has allowed that to happen in the aircraft industry, because I, my sense is that the healthcare industry is, is a bit behind on, on that. Traditionally, the captain of the ship, one of the sailing ships, he was he was lord and master. He was he, he made all the decisions, and no one no one could um, countermand them for fear of their life sometimes. Uh, we've grown up through that, and when I first started flying nearly 30 years ago, the culture was very different. Um, it was. Basically, I was flying with gentlemen who were World War II pilots and were used to um, being uh, making the decisions themselves. But we've, we've learnt that the human factor element uh, is the big ticket item in aviation and in any industry. I don't think uh, we were hearing that also in the nuclear industry on the previous speaker. Um, and the, the culture's changed completely. Uh, we have a, a just culture. What does that mean? It's a, it's a reporting culture. Uh, for instance, if, if I make a mistake, if I make a mistake in a, in a normal environment where I haven't really broken any rules, but a mistake has been made, uh, I'll self-report. I'll make a report out. It goes to my manager, fleet manager, and we'll, if it's significant enough, we'll, we'll publish it so everybody's aware of what can happen. And in fact, it could change the rules. Maybe our procedure's wrong. So it's a, it's, it's a moving, changing environment all the time. And that self-reporting culture is, is what makes it work. Now, if we've breached the rules blatantly, just culture means we'll, we'll be penalised. But if there is no blatant breach, the system is supporting you to, we want this information. We want to be able to learn from other mistakes or errors. 
and that error may not be your error, it might be a procedural error. Maybe the procedure's wrong. Uh, there are some cultures around where, the, where, where perhaps people aren't given permission to speak up, uh, but we insist that you do. David Evans, thank you very much indeed.